of a brotherly conversation about wealth, health, and race. But get this, it ain't brotherly this week, it's sisterly. It's all about the African-American and minority legislators in the Ohio General Assembly. Last week, you heard from the fellas and you know we had good questions, good dialogue, and everybody learned a lot. I know this because you write me and tell me, uh, and you tell me when it's good, you tell me when it's bad. So just know, they will let you know. But this week, this week, I'm so excited uh, to have some of my friends and some of my colleagues who I've served with in the General Assembly joining us today, the women of the Ohio General Assembly. I'm so excited to have you all. And yeah, that's why you got Juanita well, Britt down here dancing. Okay, I see you. That's Northeast Ohio. You know how they do it in Northeast Ohio, y'all. You know, that's just how it is. Uh, but we got a really good conversation um, for you all today. And I'm just so thrilled and excited about it. They're still trying to get Janine Boyd from Cleveland on. They're telling me she's coming on now. And I don't see her yet. But uh, but she's coming, and so let's get right. Let's just dig right on in, everybody. Um, 2020, 2020. All I gotta say is 2020, and then after that, you know what's going. To, I mean, it's been that kind of year, hasn't it? You know, we we started off the year with a, a global pandemic, and I'm not sure many of us have. Many of us have. Um, uh, dealt with a global pandemic. I think this is Janine we got coming in now. There, there she is. Oh my gosh, you figured you got it. Look, Janine, I say every week is always one. It's always one person. Now you, you've been doing these Zooms since February now. Come on, come on. Um, and her name says Gail Saunders, which means my producer had to let you in through her portal, which I had to do that last week, say so no problem. Uh, but, but this year we were just talking about how this year has been crazy. A global pandemic, and then we had the tragedy of the murder of George Floyd. And, and then we've been dealing with so much unrest and frustration. And then even at the Ohio House, a lot of drama, as you all know, with uh, the speaker uh, being indicted. And so much, so much going on. 2020 has been the year to remember. But let me just start off the question like this. How you feeling? You know, what's this year been like for you? If you if you just could sum it up, if there was one word to just say, this is how I feel this year, and uh, um, you know, this is just just how I'm feeling. Uh, and let let us know. And then, why don't you start off with your name and what area you represent, so people can know um, who we, who you who we talk to. Let's start with let's see who's the lucky person. Juanita, we gonna start out with you, girl. Let's go. Yeah, okay. Now everybody got to do a dance every time I, you know, since you just started off like that. What's the what's the one word that describes how you feeling? Where are you from? What's the one word? Okay, well, I'm Juanita Brent, state representative for Ohio House District 12. I represent um, a part of Cleveland and nine other suburbs, which is the southeast portion of the county. So how I feel is betrayed by 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> betrayed by 2020. All right. And that's a word. That's a new one. That's a new one because everybody else gives like the same words usually happen. And so, you know, that's new and betrayed. Uh, Senator Mahara, how you feeling about 2020 so far? How you feeling? I'm tired. <laughs> I'm sincerely tired. tired. I'm, I'm tired of this racial battle fatigue. But, you know, it was going on way before I was even born. So I'm going to keep fighting. For you. Tired. Tired and betrayed. Um, Representative Golonsky, you, you, you got that bridge and that water behind you. Um, and I, I'm assuming that's some type of backdrop there, but uh, how, how are you feeling about this? Tell us where you're from. Thank you. I'm State Representative Tavia Golonsky. I represent the 35th District, and that includes the, the, all of the city of Barberton and the southeastern small portion of Akron that is not already represented by Leader Sykes. And I'm glad to be here with you today. I have to say, I feel anxious. You know, that's how 2020 has left me feeling anxious. Wow. Well, we're gonna we're gonna come back to these words in a minute, but that that's that's helpful. Uh, okay, uh, Miss, I can't get my Zoom to work and my phone to work. Uh, Representative Boyd, um, what's that? What's that <laughs> word? Tell us about where you're from and what's that word? Hey, everybody. I'm Janine Boyd, and I have the privilege of representing House District Nine, which is Cleveland Heights, all of Cleveland Heights, which is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Shaker Heights, University Heights, and parts of wards two and four of Cleveland. And the way I describe how I'm feeling for 2020 is over it. Wow. I'm over it. You know, that's two words, but okay, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna see. It's always gotta be, again, it's always one. They ain't gonna follow the rules. And she, that's two for two, Rep Boy. That's two for two, okay? Uh, Rep Crawley, you know, tell us, tell us where you're from, what, who you represent, and, and what's your one word about 2020? Um, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for having us uh, for this discussion. I am State Representative Erica Crowley. I represent Ohio's 26th House District, which is East and Southeast Columbus, a little bit of Reynoldsburg, Groveport, and Canal Winchester. Um, and since I got to limit it to one word, I would just say 2020 has been um, exhausting. Exhausting, man. Exhausting. That's a good word. All right, uh, Miss Miss President of the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus, you know, looking like you're about to just throw it down already. Okay, you got the pose. I see you. I see you. With that beautiful <laughs> smile. Uh, well, introduce yourself and what's what's your word? What's your word? Yeah. So I will say, um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I am um, Stephanie House. I have the pleasure of representing Ohio's 11th House District, which is Cleveland, and then I have parts of Garfield Heights and Newburgh Heights. Um, and my word for 2020 is overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. That's my word man. for 2020. I'm overwhelmed. Oof, oof, man. Oof, okay. And and we didn't say, I mean, she represents the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus, which is the oldest Legislative yes. Black Caucus in the United States of America, 1967. Yes. We've been doing it here in Ohio, and she is the elected president of that institution. So uh, thank you for joining us today. And, and last and certainly not least, uh, the leader of the Ohio House, for those who don't understand what the leader of the Ohio House is, because so sometimes people don't, you know, the leader is the highest ranking person in that caucus. So the, it's a if you're a Democrat, you're in the minority caucus because you have the least amount of members. If you're the majority caucus, you're Republican because they have the most members. Uh, but then they elect who can lead them out of the group. And so she is the highest ranking person in the House, the highest ranking Democrat in the Ohio House. And, uh, and so introduce yourself, Ms. Sykes, and, and give us your word. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for getting us all together so I get to see my sisters in one room. Um, I am Amelia Sykes, State Representative for Ohio's 34th House District, the birthplace of champions, which is based in the city of Akron. Uh, I represent the parts of Akron that Rep. Golonsky does not, which is um, north, all of north, all of west, most of downtown, and a bit of south and east Akron. Uh, one precinct in Bath Township and one precinct uh, due to gerrymandering in Cuyahoga Falls. Um, if I had to describe 2020, I would say it was wild, but my feelings about 2020 is worn out with a hyphen, so it's one word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so she is the leader. Is that how it goes? She gets to impl implement her own sort of asterisks to the rules, you know, uh, she's gonna hyphenate it. Um, well, I heard words like, okay, betrayed, tired, anxious, over it, exhausting, overwhelmed, and, and wild, I mean, all of that sounds like there's a negative feeling about where we are right now. You know, it's interesting because in the last segment with the male black legislators, their words were hopeful and, um, and optimistic and encouraged. Um, and so tell me, what is that all about? Why are their words, why is the feeling different um, from that group, and they was just on last week, so it's not like a lot's happened since they were in, you know. So what's going on with that? Who wants to take the first swing at that one? I nominate oh. Red Brent to start, okay. Red Brent. Okay, oh, let's hear it. Well, I said the word betray because I had high hopes for this year. We were planning on going into our capital budget, and I was hopeful for how we as a state were gonna help with our communities, with our community centers, our hospitals, a lot of different things that I was hoping was going to be helped this year. Also, um, it's a lot of legislation that's just been left on the table. A lot of things that we haven't done when it comes to our unemployment system and still people who haven't received it and they've been trying to look for it for three months. People feel betrayed by what's been going on on the state level. Um, we've had a whole bribery situation. People should be betrayed by the public trust. I could go on and on by how people have been betrayed by this year. But, but I guess what I'll I'm asking, though, I, mean, I guess what I'm asking, though, and I think, Rep Sykes, you had your hand up, too. But I think what, I, what I'm asking is, well, how can somebody see it any differently? 
You know, how can somebody that serves in the same chamber that you served in work with you day to day? How is it that some people see hope and 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 they feel optimistic and encouraged, and and, and other folks feel betrayed and tired and anxious and, and overwhelmed and exhausted? So I wouldn't say that we are a hopeless group of people. That is not true. Um, but you asked us to be honest, and that's honesty right I, there. I do. And what I know from these group of women is we will lay it all out on the table um, so that we can make sure we're not only being a good public servants to our community, but being true to ourselves and what we are experiencing so people can get that we are humans as well. And we experience hurt and stress and discomfort like everybody else, but we still choose the capacity to lead. Now, when I the word that I use, which was similar to my sisters who are here, is we are carrying the burden of not only being uh, legislators in a minority caucus, which means there are few of us. There's nothing minor about us, as Charlita Tavares would always tell us. We're not minor. We're just fewer in numbers. Uh, we are Black or Asian and experiencing the racism that comes with that. And then we're women. And so you, we carry all of these intersections that don't allow us to be great, that burden us, that carry and weigh on us in ways that some of our colleagues don't have. Uh, and so, yeah, we are hopeful. Yeah, we're encouraged. Yeah, we hope we have all that good stuff. But the honest answer is we're worn out. Uh, we've been carrying some heavy loads and continue to carry these loads, um, but we do it with grace. You see how good we look doing it. You see how effective we are doing it. Um, but the reality is we're worn out. So we need a little bit of help. So we're gonna start handing off, now that we know some of our fellow folks are feeling a little bit better, we're gonna start handing off that workload so that we can get to that hopeful and courage spirit that they are into. And, and it's only right that we all share the load. So I got a question. When you and I also wanna add on to that. But... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Jump on in, jump on in. Yeah, I was going to add on to that, that we're also doing this during a pandemic at that too. So with this pandemic, um, I'm Asian, so I get targeted. Like They tell me to go back to my country to keep saying it is a Chinese virus. They keep telling me that my son's a little Chinese privilege boy because he's Chinese. But I'm loud. Like, I didn't even come here as an immigrant. My family came here as refugees. We went through hell just not to only survive for me to just even make it past the age of 16. Uh, so it's just one of those things where I'm just tired. Like I'm only 29, I'm gonna be 30 here in November and I don't want this future. I don't want this life for my son. I don't want him to have the speaker of the house buy people with $6 million. I don't want him and his kids to be scared to go to the hospital because they're scared that the, the broken and uh, racial inequality within our healthcare system is gonna interrogate them from getting preventative care and I'm tired, I'm just tired. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. I will tell you when um, my answer to it was more in line with your answers though, you know, um, I, I'm exhausted and I'm tired and it's been a long life and certainly been a long year. And I feel like um, well, I'm encouraged though. And I think this is what the, the gentlemen were getting at. I'm encouraged by uh, somewhat of an awakening uh, nationally, you know, I think the protests are an illustration of. Um, I think the public generally speaking all at once to say we're all exhausted, we're all tired of racism, we're all frustrated with the disparate numbers that our communities face, and and uh, and that is encouraging. And I think you know, um, um, there this this conversation is growing and getting better. Um, Rep. Crawley, you just look like you got, by the way, Rep. Sykes, when you said we look good doing it, instantly everybody started doing like this and doing like this with their hair. I don't know if y'all plan that, but that's kind of just, as soon as you said that, everybody was on cue, like, boom. So, I don't know. Rep. Crawley? No, I just wanted to echo um, Leader Sykes um, and that there is... Uh, mute everybody um, here. I'm going to mute you and then I'm going to let you back in. Uh, there. So we're going to mute everybody and then we're going to unmute Crawley. Okay. okay um, you so, you know, we are probably the most um, overlooked and undervalued um, group, but then we get blamed for everything um, that goes wrong. And we are the ones that are out here, um, you know, pounding the pavement, trying to talk to our colleagues in our own caucus and across the aisle on um, the issues that matter to our neighbors, trying to do a lot of convincing. Um, and you, we, we do the heavy lifting and, you know, um, our voices are shut out, but then when things go upside down. Uh -oh. 
we're also Did the ones everybody that... freeze uh oh no, everybody frozen can you see me can you hear me oh, okay no. um we're the ones that get blamed our feed i thought that was a very good good okay. point we're representative back. probably oh we're back yeah but just it froze for a second but it was okay okay so is it okay if I just jump in? I, I can't mm -hmm. see whose hands are up. So Representative Crawley made such a good point because it's true. It's kind of what I like to call the, the mommy complex. We're omniscient, so we're supposed to be all knowing, but just like she said, we, we often take you know on the brunt of people assuming if stuff goes south that it's our fault as well. And so the reason why I said anxious is because I feel the hat of mother and grandmother you know, quite a bit these days, my family rightly, I've set it up so that they, you know, know that they can count on me, but, you know, they also really lean on me. And I feel like, I feel like that's happening in the district that, you know, we've created a good dialogue with people here in the 35th. And part of that is now that they need help, they're reaching out to us. And, and my anxiety is really because I'm putting out fires every day, you know, it's a new thing. You know, I heard as the chair of the women's caucus, I heard a statement recently that this um, economic downturn is is really a woman's recession, and that just really sounded out to me. You know, just just thinking about the burden that women are facing. So, you know, apparently there's some kind of discussion and talk that uh, women are really getting the the hard end of this pandemic, the economic recession, unemployment, and so on. So, it might be part of our field. And you know what? You're you're right. And I want to go back. To, I think it was Rep. Carly started saying the roles that many of you are in. Um, and it's true the 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 black for those watching the black women legislators many of them are in um, important leadership roles and I can tell you being having served in the house that creates a whole nother level of burden you know um, when you're when you're knee deep in all of these issues and these debates and discussions but Rep Crawley's uh, point she's on finance committee and that's tough to be on finance committee which is by many considered the sort of uh, most complex committee in the legislature uh, because you're dealing with the state's budget, you know, and the, and the funds that come through the state. And so uh, so that that is a different uh, kind of burden. And I think where the men and the women connect is I think I think even though they were speaking more uh, optimistic, I think they were zeroed in on um, the uh, the awake. I don't know the right word, but the wakeness of of everyone that people are starting to talk about this conversation around racism and whatnot. And since we're on the point of racism, let's talk about that for a second. Now, you know, many of you have uh, been a part of this conversation around public or uh, racism as a public health crisis. I know the Legislative Black Caucus has been fully engaged with the bill that's currently pending. Um, but but uh, Rep Sykes, you've got a background in public health. Uh, uh, and, and all of you have been vocal and active in this conversation, not just this year, but but uh, in the past. So let, let's talk about what's happening, what you see happening around this conversation around racism as a public health crisis. Is this are we on point? Are we is this a new chapter in American history or is it just a moment that's going to fade away and we'll go back to the disparate numbers that we've been seeing since the beginning of time? Who wants to take that? Jumping in. Um, okay. So this is definitely, um, I would say it presents an opportunity to America. Um, you know, um, it's just a different generation. I would say specifically to our young people, you know, um, our young people are just, they're not having it, <laughs> you know, they just, they, they, they are tired um, and the world that they have experienced and things that they have seen um, have let them know that, you know, America, Ohio, you know, we like to say one thing, but then when you look at the practicality of things, it's a totally different thing and they do not align up, which is based on our um, system that was built on, you know, white supremacy and a, a system of racism. And so, you know, engaging in these conversations um, to get people to acknowledge um, America's true history so that we can truly create a more perfect union. Um, you know, I, I do not believe that it is just um, a moment. Um, I, I think it is here to stay um, and it will be here to stay until we change to truly make sure that equality, justice, um, the pursuit of life, liberty and happiness 
is a, is a true thing uh, from all Americans, regardless of your race, culture, um, gender, you name it. Yeah. Who wants to go? Who wants to respond next? A rep hey, so I would just add to you what my sister said that, you know, with the passing of Congressman Lewis uh, and just watching our our yester heroes who remained our heroes through today uh, leave this earthly plane. It's upon us and those after us to keep pushing. And I, I'm proud of how far we've pushed, even just this group of amazing women on this call that you have convened today. Um, we've certainly pushed because people have reacted mm -hmm. and not always well. So I am proud of that. I'm proud that we have pushed, and uh, and I and I and I feel when I hear the support, I feel people pushing with us mm -hmm. uh, in their respective worlds. So I, um, in the way we support each other, I feel people gravitating towards that and wanting mm -hmm. that to build that in their worlds. So I, I, I think this, I think we're, we're part of something that's growing and, and we'll keep pushing. And let me just add a little twist to that too. You know, the, this conversation around um, racism as a public health crisis and the conversation has taken place. How did you feel when you saw everything on TV happen into the state house? You know, there was a red paint and folks breaking in windows and, and whatnot. Um, you know, I, you, there was so much criticism um, of, of the, the protesters. And I think what was always left out was the conversation of the oppression of racism for a lifetime. And, and when you, you let that beast out, you're getting and seeing a reaction of exhaustion and tiredness and, and frustration. And so talk about when you saw on TV, I know in Cleveland and Akron, what you saw, you had to have seen them busting out of windows in the state house and, and running through and, and, uh, and pay. I mean, did that, how did you feel when you saw some of that in, in, in the conversation around racism as a public health crisis, connect the two? But my biggest reaction to when I saw the protests is that how people reacted on what side of the coin you were on. We had early protesters who were protesting about having wanting to wear a mask or open up the government. And mm -hmm. that reaction to that group compared to people who were protesting about civil injustice, the reactions were totally different. So I personally had a problem with how people reacted to the protesting. I think the protesting is an act for people who feel like they're being unheard. So instead of just saying, oh, we see these people protesting, you know, we as a state elected should just be out there saying, what do we need to do? How are we not listening to our people that they feel like they have to go to this measure? Mm -hmm. And that just, yeah. it pushes it back on us and not so much on the people that are out there. Yeah. And I have to mimic that too, because me, my office at the state house, when those protesters who were protesting because they couldn't get the dang on haircut, um, they didn't board up my windows and they were walking around with guns. The, the, the Black Lives Matter protesters, I mean, I understand the frustration around looting, et cetera, but they boarded up my office. They didn't do that with the other set of protesters. But, but let me just advocate for a second for the haircuts. When the barbershop was closed, I had an issue too. I mean, you you know, that was that I was with them protesters, you know, the barbershop being, that's one thing to close the restaurant. That's another thing to close the barbershops, man. So I'm just saying, Rep Sykes, you, you so, were trying yeah, to- Yeah, Commissioner. So one thing that I always talk about when people start going down this narrative is we were in session one day when there were still protests and we could hear people yelling, Black Lives Matter. And the majority party, the Republicans were pushing through a voter suppression bill. They do not care about those voices. You know, the fact that I could hear them chanting, they were walking down State Street, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And at the same time, we were looking at people standing up, praising a bill that was gonna suppress these people's right to vote. They have a lot of nerve and they have a lot of nerve because they know they are in power and they'll just wait us all out and wait till we get into the next big thing and then not be worried about it. And they know that they can maintain that power uh, through these tricks and cheating, which is what they do. And you know that day went long into the evening 
And I share with them this quote from, from a gentleman who said that uh, racism is one of the many tools that people use to remain in power. And it was just so real. And I said it over and over and over and they got madder and madder and madder at it. But it is so real. It's so real because we just watched it happen in real time. And so, you know, I think the focus is on the wrong thing. The focus is on, should be on the legislators who are not listening. And that's where it, where it needs to be. And, and I just want to say one you, time- Before you jump in, before you oh, jump shoot. in, let me give a shout out to some of our viewers. Cortez Bogard is watching. I'm gonna challenge him because he texts me a question, but he's scared to ask it to y'all directly. So I ain't ask you a question unless you send it in, brother. So check that out. Secondly, let me say a uh, shout out to uh, my homie in Cleveland, Chantel Brown, chairman of the Cuyahoga County Democratic Party and my colleague on the county. Everybody's waving to you. Hi, uh, Hope Bland. Um, our deputy, hello, thanks for, for joining us today. Our Deputy Administrator, Kena Smith, and, and Rep. Thomas West is watching y'all. I think he's spying on y'all. He's spying <laughs> on y'all. He's like, what they saying in there? I'm sorry, who did I interrupt? I did Rep. Rep. Boyd, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add to what Leader Sykes said, that one time we were in session too, and they were chanting Black Lives Matter and I Can't Breathe. And the and the the speaker had them turn up music. You remember the music, the like classical music started playing in the, wow. in the on the floor. You remember? Like all now see, music now see for, for those who are listening, that's a great point. So for those who are watching and listening, I mean, think of the immaturity and childishness of that kind of action. And that's the kind of thing that should motivate you no matter where you sit on, what side of the aisle you're on, your political perspectives. It's that kind of dismissiveness and divisiveness that should be uh, rejected and and I hope that you I hope you listen into that and I hope you pay close attention to that. Um, Rep. Crawley, I think Galanski was trying to get in, and then I'm gonna go to you. Oh, thank you. You know, I just wanted to echo everything the leader said, and and I have a way of looking at things a little bit differently too. And I really focused on who was and who was not being policed, and so a lot of people heard me say this over and over. But when you mentioned the looting and when you mentioned broken, broken windows, mm -hmm. well, I happened to see uh, Commissioner Boyce when you were with, um, with uh, Joyce Beatty mm -hmm. and uh, Harden. Also, you were with President Harden and you all were maced. In that video, I saw a young white male come from out of nowhere and he seemed to be the instigator of that entire incident and I'm, I'm not trying to be a super sleuth here and say that I have the whole thing figured out but I'm very I've been watching you know people doing peaceful protesting and that get interrupted and hijacked by people who never seem to pay the price for that and so you know maybe that makes me a little suspicious old lady but uh I, that's how I saw it and I was very concerned by who was not being policed and by the large police presence over a bunch of grandmas like myself who were you know sometimes you know with a group in a mask but we were getting all kinds of attention when folks with guns weren't getting very much so that's just what I wanted to say and yeah well said I mean I won't go into the incident myself either but I will say there's always the the agitators the people that don't want that protest to go well and and I think um the protests in Columbus certainly had those Rep Crawley you were going to say something uh, thank you, Commissioner. I was just going to say that I had the pleasure to sit on um, the CSRAP board a couple of weeks ago. And for those who tuned in, they were um, in the beginning going over the budget and how much it costs to clean the handprints off and pot the flowers again or repot them and how the grounds look all beautiful. Again, it, we were getting ready to talk about removing the statue of Christopher Columbus or having policies around that. And no time when they were going through the budget or how the grounds look good again, did they say, well, I wonder, or I hope that we have addressed the systematic or systemic racism or the institutional racism or the oppression or listen to these voices that feel unheard to, you know, and, and really um, did something about their concerns and being shut out and unheard so they don't feel like they have to come down and be on the grounds and put handprints, washable handprints mm -hmm. um, on on this, the building. I really hope that we address that. Um, and right. so that, you know, they can live in be happy and prosperous uh, 
not once was that ever brought up or the concerns about why these things are even taking place. So whenever mm -hmm. I feel like my colleagues are talking about the destruction of businesses or buildings and the state house and statues, it is always a deflection from the real issue and that is to leader Sykes point to not address racism because that is a way to stay in power. Man, that was on point. That was on point. I, I think what you're doing is you're starting to, the, the male legislators are all signing in and I'm seeing stuff, you know, Phil Robinson just texted and said that he says, these are his exact words. He says, this session with the female legislators is really good. I'm really enjoying this. So I, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying brothers, it, it is going well. I want to, Thank you all. So, so let me shift gears a little bit. You know, so we've got you know all of this stuff happening at the state house. We got a global pandemic, uh, and you all serve in in uh, different roles beyond the legislature in your various communities. One thing that we have not talked about, or we've talked about, but very little of this year that I think is getting overlooked, is the census. You know, every ten years we get one chance to be counted. And then for the next 10 years, we will use that data and information to decide everything, absolutely everything. And, and so talk about the importance and the value of the census as you know it. And, and just, are you, have you all filled out your, your have you all done your 10 questions in, in less than 10 minutes? Uh, yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. I, 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 they, they, everybody, they probably did theirs. These are the type of people that probably did theirs the first day they opened up the census. So just, I'm just saying they have been done. Uh, Rep Sykes said, you, you go be honest. You said, no, I didn't do mine right away. Okay. Um, so, but talk about, talk about in, in your own way, how important and valuable the census is and, and why people should be counted. You know, there are people who are afraid of the census. You know, a lot of um, immigrants and, and refugees, um, uh, they don't trust the census process. So let's start with you, Senator. Um, what do you, what, you know, what's, how important is this and, and why should folks um, register in the census? Yes, because like what you've already touched point on, uh, most refugees and immigrants are intimidated because they think the data is going to be taken somewhere or they just think that immigration is going to come and take them because of their legal status, they're not citizens or et cetera. So it's important because it means that we count, we matter. Those funds go towards our schools, our healthcare system and our political representation. I need those numbers. I need those numbers guys because I need to know you guys are really there. I'm not the only Asian in Columbus, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Who else wants to take a stab at that? Okay, give us, you know, help the public understand just how important the census is and, and why uh, that 10 minute, 10 question survey is so critical. Representation is, is everything. Oh, I'm sorry, Rep. Galanti. Um, but everything is about representation. So as we get ready to redraw these lines, we need to know how our, draw, our lines are going to be drawn. You know, right now it's predicted that we're going to lose a congressional seat in Ohio. I'm hoping the predictions are wrong, that we can keep all 16 of our congressional seats. But that's how we determine how many people, you know, that we send to, you know, D.C., so we have to have everybody counted. We need representation. We need as much as representation in Ohio as much as possible. So everyone needs to be counted as much as possible, including that grandson of yours that sleeps on your couch. He needs to be counted too. And you know, it's so true because, you know, Ohio is competing with states like Georgia and North Carolina, who, you know, all of the Southern states are generally growing at a much faster rate. Uh, and, and so Ohio, the seventh largest state, we're working very hard to just hold strong where we are, but it's just not working out. We're just not growing as fast as these other states. But, but get this, over $34 billion comes to the state of Ohio annually based on census numbers. Medicaid, education, transportation are all funded based on census data. And you get one shot every 10 years, this is our chance. And so uh, any real experiences around, I mean, let me let me tee this up for you. It, it, maybe maybe Rep Sykes, you can take this question because you but your public health background. You know when you think about how COVID nineteen jumped off this year, and you know you saw states like California and New York sort of get the immediate attention from FEMA and and it, you know it's census based. You know and then when the vaccine comes, you know how's that process work? You know when they finally do get it, is that based on census and what else is based on census data that you're aware of? Everything, um, people that stuff that you don't even think about how we fund our schools when we're looking at um, the streets and the infrastructure, 
Um, all of the money, you know, one of the things that people don't always understand about state government is we are the filter from all of the money that comes from the federal government. And we decide where it goes and how much. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure we have that big hole at the top. So we're getting all the money that we possibly can. And that is completely based on the amount of people that we have in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, Brent talked about the representation part of it. And she's talking about a representation in Congress. We need as many people as possible represent us in Congress at the national level. So when they start talking about these funding packages and that we have some money for infrastructure, we have money for health care and education, that we have more than a few folks up there saying it needs to come to Ohio. Uh, the more people we have there uh, in the, the U.S. House of Representatives, the more voices will be saying, come on, we're going to bring these coins back to uh, our state. Um, you know, I'll just say really quickly, I know you asked if we answered the census on the first day, and I didn't. So I'm not going to judge you. I have done mine, and it sat on my counter for at least two weeks. I got the uh, follow-up messages, and, you know, I'm the person, I know, I know better, and I didn't do it right away, but I got it done, but I just want to say that so there is no shame on this phone call of feeling because you haven't done it yet, you're just not going to do it. It is all right, and I literally went through that thing and said, oh, is this it? So it took me no time to do. So what, five minutes maybe? May, not even. Very easy. It only took me probably that long because I had to make sure I actually completed all of it because it was very, very simple. Um, and, you know, I do feel bad that people don't trust the government and that they don't want to participate. And that's just something we're going to have to work on uh, as a community because and as a state to make sure that you understand that you got people working for you. And we are all trying to make sure the Ohio promise is a reality for everybody. And that that is working for you and letting people know that we work for you. So you can find us anytime. Uh, but again, the census also lets you know how this representation is divided up in the state and whether or not you do get legislators who are working for you or legislators who are working for themselves in their own self-interest. Yeah, well said. And I, Rep. Galanski, I'm going to go to you. I, I think I inadvertently skipped over you, so I want to tee you up here. But before I do, let me give a few shout outs. Elizabeth Kilgore, uh, Megan Kilgore, thank you so much for joining us. Jalada Absalom, I know y'all know Jalada. Jalada's watching us today. Hey, from Youngstown. Uh, Veronica Sims, that's an Akron person. So yeah, hey, Veronica Sims. Uh, Shaquilla Richardson, Ryan Ivory, Dustin uh, Molefinger, I think that is, or Holfinger. Tim Johnson, Angela White, Lamar Peoples, Chris Grant. Thank you all so much for tuning in and joining us. I hope that you're enjoying it. Um, uh, my producer just told me that there's a lively chat going on uh, behind this, behind the scenes here about the race issue. Oh, yeah. And so let's just go back to that. I yeah. want Rep. Delonsky oh, to respond to census. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to stay on the census, but, but work in the race piece. And then we're going to circle back on the race since it seems that folks want to talk about. And I do have one question from uh, Jonathan Scales that I'm gonna ask uh, you all. So um, we'll go to Tavia and then Rep House and then we'll, we'll get back to the race question and this question. Thank you so much, Commissioner. What I wanted to point out with, to piggyback on what Leader Sykes was saying is that yes, if you feel like you've ever been um, counted out or you feel like maybe your voice didn't count, that's what the census is about. So it, it is really important to let the government know I'm here, I matter, and I care that you notice me. And I, so I think that people need to understand that that's the value of the census is what do you want to know about America? Do you want to know that America is made up of a bunch of different races? Do you want us to know that, um, you know, whatever your family status is, this is a way of getting information out about who you are. And once we know that, then we know how to serve you. And so I wanna encourage people, what I'm doing personally in my own little neighborhood is kind of, you know, just going around and just, you know, saying hi to my neighbors and making sure to them, you know, when we go, go out for our walk, saying to them, hey, you know, did you take a minute to do your census? Just a, you know, just a chance to mm -hmm. a neighborly chat. And I wish if we all did that around the whole US, then we wouldn't have to worry about the fact that our federal government is still failing us and has some kind of a crazy plan to pull back on the, the workers who were going to be socially distanced and masked anyway when they came to your house, which might make the undercount a very real concern. So I just wanted to say that and thank you. Uh, Rep House. Yeah, so I, I'm actually, it was just a question regarding like, I guess the race debate, but racism as a public health crisis, right? So um, there was an article this morning that talked about Mansfield City Council. 
and oh, I man, saw that. Oh control. my gosh! So, and, and oh. I'm explain, <laughs> I, no, I want to oh. explain this. You know, um, so basically, uh, Mansfield City Council voted five to four to reject, um, you know, the resolution addressing racism as a public health crisis. Right, but I may explain to you just how racism work, um, because Mansfield is a beneficiary from the state in that in a prison system, right? A prison that everybody wants to talk about jobs, and then you look at that population um, when you look at the demographics. Because I, I I just pulled the the, the demographics of because it's House District Two, um, I believe it's Romachek, um, mm -hmm. but it's only like. 7% African American. When you look at that prison system, it's way beyond 7% that's in that particular uh, prison system down in Mansfield. Mm -hmm. But no, even we're talking about the census. Our people <laughs> are going to be counted from where they, 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 they come from, right? So it's 10 years of investment that goes to the city of Mansfield where people don't live. They're just there temporarily less than two years before the, when they go back home to their home communities, probably for more eight, the eight years, because this is this is what we have. We won't get those resources and dollars. And then when you read the article, mm -hmm. the response of the response from some of those council members was like, because it was a petition started from a group of women. Shout out to women. Women always doing the work. Um, I guess it was a group of nine women in, in the city of Mansfield that put this petition forward. And, and a city council person that said, well, you know, they're already active. They can just keep on it. They just got to work a little bit harder. Just think about that. You are the one who was elected to do a job. Many times, many of these res resolutions are asking for groups and committees, city governments that have the resources to convene people to do the work just to see where the level of disconnect may be and see how policies impact people based on race. But you have a city council people that feel like, no, it's the responsibility of this, you know, this group of hardworking women to, to do more work and figure it out. Yeah. It is, yeah. it is yeah. insane. And then, and then to have the notion, well, well, most of my constituents, they don't even like this. Well, most, most white people don't believe race because you've been the beneficiary of it. So you're really not the good good voice for it. But I just wanted to come bring that up and put that no, on the record. Some of us are paying did. attention and that is just foul. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, yeah. especially with the census thing, many people have been fighting really to get people that are incarcerated, you know, to be counted in the communities that they're going to go back to knowing that they're only in prison less than two years. Yeah. But yeah, you know, so that's the, it. The, the best response is to vote folks like that out. I mean, you know, I was just saying to, to folks the other day, every year people like you and I, we got to stand before the voters and, and present our record. And that resolution to me illustrates your value system. It illustrates you as an institution and you as an individual and where you stand. And for that, that's enough for me to not vote for you. And so, um, you know, I hope the folks in Mansfield are paying attention. And if you haven't gotten a chance to read that article, uh, check it out. Uh, do a search and, and check it out. I got two questions here. I got to get to the folks who are writing in because I, I want to be uh, faithful to my viewers that are that are uh, chiming in with us here. This question is to you, Representative Sykes. And this is from, I'm, I'm, I swear this is a real live question. It came right in, so I didn't make this up. This is from the AKAs, and it says, um, we want to know where our soror, Leader Sykes, got her shirt. <laughs> it's a real question. I'm telling so you, it's a real question. Look at that. Look at that. I'm sure it's real. I'm sure it's real. And also, if you don't know, Representative House is a member of Alpha Cap Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Um, See what this they shirt on. comes from Planned Parenthood. They had a campaign uh, a couple years ago called Stand with Black Women. Uh, finally, uh, groups started to recognize the work and the struggles and the burdens that Black women face, um, and particularly in the reproductive rights space, as women were, uh, there was lots of legislation hammering reproductive rights access, and the people who were getting the short end of the stick were Black women. Um, not be, Just like we can't access uh, good quality health care for 
any of our body parts, it was especially bad for our reproductive rights. So uh, Planned Parenthood put together their Stamped with Black Women campaign. Uh, they have some t-shirts and a few other things. So um, can't necessarily tell you to you know buy all their stuff, but that's just where I got this from. All right, all right. I, I think you just showed them, uh, sold them some shirts for them. So I'm, I'm sure that's the <laughs> um, case. Hopefully more so we get people to stand with black women. It's more about the statement than the shirt. And the point is to stand with black women. And I thought it was perfectly fitting for uh, this conversation today. So the next question we got came in from line from Jonathan Scales, who asked the question, what's the state's agenda from a leadership perspective on what can the team and what can the team deliver um, from the people who are in office now? So I think what he's asking here is, what is the broader agenda from a leadership standpoint to address some of these issues around race? And um, what can we get from the people who are in office now? And I assume he's talking about the governor's mansion and maybe some of the, you know, you, you know, um, our secretary of state. I mean, they're kind of in the news right now. So what can we expect from them? Who wants to take that one? What should we expect from them? I'll go again, because you know, I, I just want to make something very clear to a lot of people, because um, I don't feel like it's being told enough. You know, we started this coronavirus, and just like many health outcomes, there are racial disparities when it comes to communities of color. And it was very predictable that this was going to happen in the coronavirus, and it was preventable. Yet, there was nothing in place to address the coronavirus as it was gonna impact black and brown uh, communities uh, and more. And so because of people like Sandra Williams and Stephanie House and Erica Crawley calling the governor to do something, they were slow. Eventually they put together a minor minority health strike force and the strike force had a report due on June 11th. It has not been completed. Wow. We are almost wow. two months away from the final report. Now, let me contrast that with the task force to open up the barbershops and the massage parlors and the nail salons and the bars and the restaurants. Those were up and turned around, convened, reports out in a week. We are two months late from a report. That lets me know they don't really care about my black life or um, our sister representative house who's recovering from COVID because there is no plan to address the health disparities from the state level. None, absolutely none. Uh, and that is abysmal. And so I don't have a whole lot of faith at this point. We, we all we got. Um, and so we just have to continue to share within our own communities, best practices and things that we can do. We did a call with Congresswoman Beatty and Congresswoman Fudge and elected officials across the state um, and that is probably the only consistent message that we've had because we're not getting it from our state government. So we have to demand more. We need to call it out when we see it. Uh, this has been a conversation that has gotten very little to no attention, but its ramifications are real because people are unnecessarily getting sick and dying. Uh, and that's just not, that's not okay. Who, who else wants to respond to that question? I, I'll just chime in a little bit. You know, people say, well, what can we expect from this leadership? Um, and I think people need to understand the context that um, for over a generation, the state of Ohio um, has been led by Republicans from an executive level, from a legislative level, from um, a judicial level, it's been Republican led. And if you think that this is good, continue on, continue to reward um, what I would say a lack of leadership and ensuring that prosperity happens for all Ohioans and not a select few. Um, and really get beyond, you know, because again, the thing that happens in politics is there are intentional strategies used to distract us, right? Mm -hmm. Those strategies are in specific, specific issues are guns, abortion, and religion. Now we think about COVID-19 right now. What does COVID-19 have to do anything with religion, guns, and abortion? When you think about unemployment, what do guns, abortion, and religion have to do with unemployment? You can't get a job. Your children returning back to school. Should they do it online? Should they do it in, um, uh, in person? We have been bamboozled as a society to think that just because someone is saying, I hold these values, 
to my heart that it translate into true investment in people when they need it, in the time that they need it. And it just, it just has it. And this doesn't have anything to do with race. We are talking about economics. Um, and so I just do not see it from the Republican leadership. Uh, they, they, they have not made the necessary investments to all people in Ohio. And I feel like if you want something different, um, I think Mr. Skills, uh, I, I would encourage you to contact those who represent you and others to make sure that you are holding public officials accountable for the work that they should be doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's not gonna happen. No one is just gonna give up their elected seat. Communities have to demand it. Like we put people in office, you need to take people out. And that's why in the Ohio General Assembly, we got every two years. So I hope you are registered to vote and I hope you will vote for people who care about COVID-19, who care about unemployment, who care about our babies going to school and being safe. So Any, who else wants to take take that question from Jonathan Scales? Anybody? I got more. I mean, all right, I'm gonna start directing this question to people. So Linda James Myers asked the question. It's kind of a long question, so bear with me, but it's a census question. And she asked, and thanks Linda for tuning in. But she asks, what can be done about inmates in prison in rural white communities that, that they will be counted as residents for their legislators? So for example, in Mansfield, are the uh, prisoners that exist in the prison, are they counted um, for the Mansfield or where they're from? You know, uh, and, uh, and I don't know, may, maybe, um, you know, the answer to that, if, if not, we, we can um, work through they're it. Counted in, they're, they're, they're actually counted in Mansfield. They're in, they're counted for Mansfield. They're, and they're so they're counted in Mansfield. That's, um, you know, it's federal policy. And I know there have been groups that have specifically mm -hmm. been working on this issue to get it changed, understanding that most people who are serving um, in an institution um, usually are serving less than two years. Mm -hmm. uh, the census is counted for 10 years. And so there is a significant gap when you think about the investments that go back into people's home communities um, uh, before you went into prison and of course upon when you go back home. So unfortunately, um, the federal policy has not been changed to be more reflective of what happens when people get sentenced. And again, it's a federal policy. We have to get legislative leaders, you know, executives um, like the president to understand that, ensure that our policies are equitable because this goes into a place of a policy that is definitely not equitable and it benefits certain communities over others. Um, and we have to work to change that policy. And, and she also asked, Linda James Myers also asked, and her second part of the question was, and, um, uh, and who then uh, who who then want to deny their right to vote after the after their inmates? So I think she's asking, um, um, a can they vote after uh, they get out of prison? And uh, and b um, is it only uh, while they're in prison that they can't vote? I, I think that's correct. I don't Anybody know. But okay, so respond? I would say Rep. Crowley or Rep. Delance if they wanted to answer the question. Um, but Rep. I would say. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Rev. Galanski was raising her hand. Okay. So when you in Ohio, felons can vote. Period. And and that that means when you're not in prison. So once you you know paid your debt to society and you get out, you can vote. That's my understanding. Rep. Crawley. Yeah. I you um, have to make sure you re-register. Um, there you go. That's yeah, a good you point. You just have to re-register, um, update your registration, and you should be able to vote. And if That's anybody right. tells right. you that you cannot, um, please know that that is a lie. Um, but you do have to check your reg your voter registration. And the only thing I'll add is, if someone is in county jail and they have not been convicted of a felony, no you vote. can still vote. So even if you are no in jail for a misdemeanor and you have less than a year, you can vote. And if you are on trial for a felony but have not been convicted but are still incarcerated, you can still vote too. A lot of people don't know that. Um, I know there's been a lot of effort for prison ministries to get people their right to vote. And sometimes it doesn't always work out that well, um, but you can. Great point. Thanks for uh, adding that. We've got uh, about six minutes, but we can go a little bit longer. I think this, if you can stay, if you gotta go, I understand, I know you're all busy, but we can stay a few minutes longer just because I wanna make sure I get to the questions that are coming in. Let me give a quick shout out to Joel Jones, Joel Jones and Tim Johnson, 
uh, as well as our county administrator, Ken Wilson, uh, for joining us today. The next question I have is, um, it doesn't say who it's from, it just says, um, there's a small number of women of color in the House and Senate. Um, how do you all support each other as leaders? I'll go since I'm in the Senate. <laughs> so with me over in the Senate, it's just me and Sandra. Uh, I have her numbers, she has mine. We have those uh, late night hashes about frustrations, about everything going on. And I always look to her like, I'm not crazy. Like, this is not right, right? Like, it gives me like a, I guess you want to say a sense of uh, normalcy uh, to know that I'm not the only person thinking like, this is this is not what how life is supposed to be. And of course, I have all the other women's numbers here on our call today. And of course, I always text them um, whenever I need something. Uh, one time, me and Janine were texting at five in the morning and stuff because I was just so frustrated about racism and um, with my child getting attacked because he's Asian. So we we have each other's numbers. I call them my sisters. They have mine. They call me. I, I would like for them to call me before my bedtime, but we have each other's numbers. <laughs> Let me just say to my brothers that might be listening to have my number, don't call me at 5 a.m. Yeah, yeah, if you call me at 5 a.m., we're going to have an issue. All right. So uh, that's cool. Who else wants to talk about how do you all support each other as women in the fight, in the struggle in the legislature? Hey, I just want to say, so these, I don't know what I would do, honestly, in the legislature without these relationships with these women here, um, Rep House and Sykes and I came in together and uh, we made a commitment back then that we would always be honest and open with each other and never let anything, uh, you know, anything could come between us to always talk and be open. And we have kept that promise to each other. And um, certainly there are people that don't appreciate the strength of these relationships. They don't appreciate the, um, the consistency of these relationships, you know. Make them they, hate us, make them hate us. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget Christy. Christy was a part and of Christy, and I was gonna say, Christy, you know, we we I was gonna bring up Christy that even the, the one of our sisters who came in with us and who uh you know later moved on to start a family and, and left the legislature, we still we still you know get her feedback and her advice and her uh, input on things so we've really and now we've added these 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 new sisters uh to uh the caucus the you know the original diva caucus um uh which by the way someone nicknamed us out of hatred <laughs> like out of jealousy and so, so do y'all have like a handshake or something y'all have like a handshake y'all do or <laughs> some kind of like thing y'all do like to let somebody know you a member oh okay i just saw i caught i caught that i need that caught that okay i got it i got it i got it all right <laughs> well and and commissioner boyce can i jump in here please yeah so i want everybody who's watching this or listening to this you should take a picture right now because these are some of the hardest working women I've ever met, okay? Right now, they're, they've already sent out notes to their offices about new legislation. They're doing all this backward and in heels, and it's impressive as all get out. So as much as we might look really great, and we talk a, a good game, and we're great on your show, these are some of the hardest working people I've ever met, and they're working for their people, and you should know that. So when you're looking at them, part of that, that really fills my cup every time I come around them, knowing that they are working so hard, and that me just feeling lazy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in on that? Because I, I think this is really good for the uh, women that might be listening and, and they didn't work in the legislature. Maybe they work at a law firm or they work at a medical institution and they may be thinking, man, it's tough being the only or being one of a few. And so I think this is, I think that's why they asked the question. Anybody else want to chime in on how you guys support one another? Uh, I think Erica had her hand up first and then next we'll go to uh, Representative Brent. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I just want to say I, we all like check in with each other from time to time. Um, I know with Senator Mahara and myself, with us being the only like women of color in the General Assembly from uh, Franklin County and our delegation is large, um, it can be isolating at times. And so we have like sent text messages like, how you doing, girl? Um, both of us were um, the only single parents um, in the General Assembly, and that comes with its own um, set of issues. And so we've been supportive in that way. And I just have to say that my other sisters that are on the call have been um, gracious enough to 
you know, when I'm bringing the girl, my twins with me to the state house, they are like, hey, they can come to my office or watch TV anytime or, you know, just really being supportive of me and my situation and um, having to be flexible given my family. And I am super um, duper like appreciative to them, um, come, including me into the Diva Caucus um, and, and my family as well. But do you know the handshake? Did they did they show you the handshake yet? I did. Have you you been in long enough? Oh, you know it. Okay, okay. My fault. My fault. You know. You you you. Oh, that's all. I got you. I got you. I got yeah, you. I feel that's like right. you want us to show it to you. That's why you asked, and I'm not. I know what it is. Hey, hey. I mean, you know. Yeah. I, I'd like. I'd like to see it. Yeah. I'd like to know it. But you know. I, I mean, you know. Uh, Miss Representative Brent, you were gonna you were gonna chime in too. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, one of the biggest things that I appreciate about this is accountability. Um, when you are really trying to lead with excellence, you have to have people that hold you accountable. You don't want people to just have you out there because you can be leading very strongly wrongly. And I know that might sound very incorrect grammarly with the grammar, but um, I appreciate the accountability. I appreciate that we're all just connected. No one told us when we came in that you need to be connected to these women. Like no one gives you the code. They think it's a book we have. Like, why don't you guys argue with each other? Is this a thing of just respect. Um, and also too, one thing that all of us do, and not everybody on this call does, is that we're trying to bring other people along with us. So it's not that we just want our own seat at the table. We're trying to add more seats for other women, other women of color to be in this place too. We've had full, you know, healthy discussions as I like to call it, about how we can get more people at this table with us. And that's what we're all looking here to do is so it won't just be this, um, the the seven of us that are here on this, on your Tell Us How Hob, we want it to be 99 of us. <laughs> man, because yeah, we yeah. know. The brother can't, you know, man, they like, all of y'all get out, we'll it take it. It was a time we didn't have the first um, African-American woman to come to the state house till 1971, Helen Rankin. And I mean, and Tina is our first Asian-American in the Senate, like, I'm mm -hmm. tired of keep on us of having the first. Um, it was time to the point where we can say, well, it's 99 of us. We're here. You can't deny us and you're gonna have to work with us, period. I mean, I I think that you all have been uh, just so amazing. Uh, I, I happen to have served with some of you. I served with the originals for uh, a term. I served with uh, the OGs, you know, uh, uh, and, and then the others, while I haven't served with, I've been around enough to see how amazing and valuable you are to the state of Ohio. And I really mean that. You are all dynamic. You are all um, highly intelligent. And um, it makes me feel good knowing that we not only have you all as individuals, but how you work together. And that's something I can attest to personally. Uh, I mean, they are strong because they understand that um, we're stronger together, you know. Um, and uh, and that and you you truly exude that in how you lead every day and and so I'm grateful to have you as friends. Um, we can continue to go, and, but here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to give you all a 30 second closer on talking to the folks who are watching. Uh, whatever you want to say, however you want to feel, whatever you want them to remember, either about you or about the time we're in now. And then I'll close out with just a few remarks, but but if we could, you know, let's just go around and and share um, with you. Oh, oh, I got a, I got a quick note that my colleague Commissioner John O'Grady is is watching. We all, all do me a favor and wave to John O'Grady, Commissioner O'Grady. He's on vacation, but uh, taking the time to join us. He's been a great partner in the struggle and the fight, and most importantly, the progress that we've had at Franklin County. And so I'm so grateful that he's joined us uh, for a second on his vacation. Give the family, Pam, and, and all the kids my best. Um, uh, if you could just give us 30 seconds on anything you want to say, just, you know, imagine you had the microphone and let's pretend that there are thousands of people watching. They're not, but just let's pretend there are. And you had 30 seconds to say to them something that they would remember about you, about this moment, about this day, about this conversation, whatever it is, what is it you want them to remember? Let's start with Rep. Crawley, and then I'm gonna work my way around the screen here. So Rep. Crawley, you're up first, Rep. Galonsky, Rep. Sykes, Rep. House, Rep. Brent, Rep. Boyd, and then Senator Mahara. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I just wanna say quickly when it comes to the census, I learned earlier 
earlier today that the state up north um, is ahead of us in the um, percentage of completion. And I'm a competitive person. That just can't, right. we cannot have that state up north um, beat us in the census uh, percentage. So I need everyone to complete their census. I, I did it late too, but it's done. Um, so please do that so we can um, kill the state up north again, um, even out in the census outside of football, because we don't know where that's going to be. Yeah, that, that changes my whole perspective on everything. I mean, we're going to keep going for the next two hours just on the census now. So <laughs> get some water, get comfortable, because we're about to do a marathon on just the census. All right. That, that's that's some bull that the, that Michigan is up on us. No, no, no. We got to Can't have that. Rep yeah. Golonsky, what, what would you like to say? 30 seconds. Thank you so much. I just want to leave people with this. The Ohio promise is and includes in part that we work for you. It also tells you that we we have the ability to live, work and retire safely and securely. And so if you believe in that dream, if you believe in the Ohio promise, I invite you to come join us by first making sure you're registered to vote and then voting on November 3rd so we can make that dream a reality for more Ohioans. Thank you. Thank you. Rep Sykes. Thank you again, Commissioner. And again, this is a great discussion. Uh, to the people who are watching, I want you all to be very, very clear um, about the decisions that are made for you are going to be made by someone. And maybe we should start picking the someones that we want, uh, that look like us, that understand our needs, our desires, our hopes, our dreams, and who are willing to help us fulfill the Ohio promise. And that only can be done if you fill out the census, if you vote, and then you tell your friends and your family to do the same. The things that you're unhappy with do not have to stay this way we have the power to change them. We just have to figure out how to do it and we have to do it consistently so people truly understand the power is within the constituents and not in politicians. Well said. Rep House. Hey, well, again, thanks for everybody for tuning in. We'll see you all next week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Hey, come on back. Come on back. No, I, I got a feeling um, they're going to be I'll writing me about say, this. I'll have you back. People, um, I know um, Rep. Brent um, and um, Leader Sykes kind of alluded to this. Um, basically, just about all the rules that we all are governed by that, that control our daily lives, um, they were never designed for the majority of us, right? And we need to understand that very, very clearly. And in order to get to, like I said, this place of um, freedom and having a system that truly works for all, um, we have to, in the words of Senator Cory Booker, stand up, speak up, and act up. You know, we, we can't afford to be silent when we see that things are wrong. You know, we cannot be um, just, you know, just, just lax about what is happening when we see things and we know, you know, you get that spirit and knowing that this stuff ain't right. And, and we, we have to just be bold. So I just encourage you to have the boldness that you need um, to fill out the census, vote and hold public servants, politicians, elected officials accountable because we truly do work for you. And many times there are some that know it and others that don't. You need to make sure you always make us know it and make us earn your vote yeah, every well time. Said. Well said. Yeah. Red Brent. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner Boyce, for this opportunity to share, be a part of your platform. But I just want to remind everybody is that the State House is the people's house. And it's, it's called that for a reason, that you belong to come there, no matter if it's the committee hearings, the floor sessions, or if it's coming to our office, this is your house. You belong here. Your voice deserves to be heard. And if you have to catch a ride, catch a Greyhound, catch the public transit that we are not public, um, funding properly, if you have to get on a, uh, a little scooter that you have to rent, um, come here. You belong here. And, you know, I don't think people hear that enough or people t emphasize on how important their voice is and how much influence the state government has on your day-to-day -day operations, no matter if it's unemployment, no matter if it's the rules for child care or if your restaurant, the business in your community is gonna stay open. That's all being affected by state government right now. So you are so valuable and we want to hear from you. And if somebody does not wanna hear from you, they just tell them you about to lose your job. Thank you. <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it. Thank you, Red Brett. Red Boyd. 
Hey, thank you, Commissioner, for convening us. This was great. Um, I miss seeing all these faces more frequently. Um, you know, I everything my sisters all said is their pearls of wisdom. Uh, the only thing I would add is, you know, racism is a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. It is as insidious, as infectious, and as deadly as the uh, COVID-19 uh, in that we, we still aren't working towards a, a, a true cure together. Uh, and my, our colleagues in the House, not one signed on to the resolution, not one Republican signed on. I'm sorry, just not one Republican signed on. And I really truly believe well, that's that. That's fact. You don't, you don't, yeah. you don't have to say that if that's just fact. Yeah. So, and yeah. and then I believe in part that is because it would require them then to start looking at all the policies they produce and offer. Uh, because that is what acknowledging racism as a public health crisis does. It creates an atmosphere where we start looking at policy through that lens. And we only offer policies that dismantle, address, and treat uh, the crisis, the disease. So, uh, I would remind everyone that, and I would encourage you to say it, say it in conversations, Zoom happy hours every now and then, just bring it up. Racism, you know, racism is a public health crisis. So <laughs> I think it's important for everybody to keep saying it. And, I, and, and, and also, while you are advocating, while you are saying racism is a public health crisis, while you are calling your legislators, while you are making sure your voter registration is up to date, and your uh, families and friends that are registered to vote and everyone is completing their census. While you're doing all that, please take care of yourselves. Please take care of each other. Please check in on people that you think are doing great because they may not be. Yeah. The, 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 the quality of life has been impacted by both of these diseases for all of us. And so I think it's, if we don't take care of each other, of ourselves and each other, uh, you know, I think we, we, there's too much at risk to be isolated. So just check in with each other, care for yourself, wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands, and take good care. <laughs> good job. Franklin County, Franklin <laughs> County mask all the way. Senator Mahara, bring us home uh, 30 seconds. What what, uh, what would you leave the folks watching with? Yes, again, thank you, Commissioner Boyce, for hosting all of us. This is very refreshing, and it makes me feel somewhat hopeful for my return back to session here. Because I'm sorry, you guys are you have a terrible speaker. Well, not now, I hope. But, <laughs> but with me, I have a Senate president who has us working over the summer. So I'm going back to the State House, I want to say, uh, in two weeks. So it's refreshing for me to hear this for my colleagues on the other chamber. Uh, I mean, it's refreshing for me to hear their voices in general because of the fact that uh, it feels like the, all summer long, I've been working, working, working for what? Before the other side to just sit there and I guess take $60 million and bribe people with. <laughs> wow. All in all, though, all seriousness now, let's get back to my 30 seconds. I just wanna say uh, thank you for watching. Never confuse yourself of what people think you can do with what you know in your heart that you can do because truth mm. is people are always going to judge you on the outside but they're not look at you in the inside with your willpower and your vision for a better life so uh, when i took on the role to to run for office for the open seat it wasn't as ideal as i'd like it to be but it was the best decision of my life um, coming from someone who came from a family of uh, refugee parents from laos um, a single parent and for someone who doesn't have the right connections like Larry Householder does, uh, it was very intimidating. But now that I'm here, now that I'm with everybody on this panel, especially with Erica being a single mother to twins, it makes me feel like, whoa, I'm not the only one suffering right now. I'm, 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 I'm doing it, but this is not the way life's supposed to be for us. We went through hell and back and we need to make sure our future generation doesn't have to go through the hell and back that we had to go through. So thank you for watching Franken County. And I hope to see you guys at the polls. Absolutely. Well, I, I just can't say enough. Uh, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your very busy schedules. And I know um, Rep Boyd is a new mom. She I still consider you new mom space. So uh, still adjusting, but you took time to, to be with us. So I appreciate it to the folks watching. You know, um, th these folks have uh, dedicated their lives to public service, uh, helping you um, 
increase your quality of life. And, and that's really what this conversation is about. I'm so grateful uh, to have an opportunity serving as county commissioner with my colleagues, Marilyn Brown and John O'Grady, uh, who are committed to not just this conversation, but the work that comes from it as well. And uh, we're here every Wednesday, same time, same place, having this discussion, a brotherly conversation about race, health, and wealth uh, in our community. This time it was the sisterly conversation, which was all that probably, I must say, best show ever, best show ever. I, I, I gotta say, I gotta say. Uh, and then our county administrator, Ken Wilson is watching. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, and I'm just so excited to have the support of Franklin County as we do this and hope to have you all back at some point. Uh, Rep. Crawley, we got some work to do together. I know you've got some, some important bills here locally that, uh, that we can work together on. So we'll have you on and we'll talk about that in another time. With that, thanks everybody for tuning in. It's been a great conversation. See you next week, same time, same place. Thanks, Bye. Gail. Thank you, Gail, for the hookup. Gail says she did a thumbs up to you. She did a thumbs up. All right. Bye-bye. We'll see you guys. Thank you.